Again, uh, it's really good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, as we've been uh, marching through the New Testament, we now find ourselves in the book of Acts, and more specifically in Acts chapter 2. So uh, if you're able, uh, it'd be helpful if you can follow along uh, as we look at these verses. Uh, we'll be starting in verse 1 in a moment. But in Acts chapter 2, this is, this is a huge chapter in the New Testament. This is when... Everything kind of gets kick-started uh, in connection to the kingdom of God now um, contacting the earth and the church being established and the Holy Spirit being given. Uh, this is a huge chapter in the New Testament, and so I think it is definitely worthy of our attention and our study here this morning. <coughs> Last week we saw in chapter 1 kind of a chapter of preparation. Uh, the disciples were told by Jesus, hey, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, uh, when the Holy Spirit, you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit, and you'll receive the power that you need to go out and do the ministry that I'm calling you to do. And so they're told to just hang out there. But they're not just hanging out there. We find, like in verse uh, 14, that they were in one mind, continually devoting themselves to prayer, and they were unified as they were waiting there for this promise to be fulfilled, that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on them, and in the power of the Spirit, they would go out and proclaim the gospel message that Jesus had died and was risen again, and there was forgiveness of sins for all people, Jews and Gentiles, and they would proclaim that first in Jerusalem and then eventually to the remotest parts of the world. And we saw all of chapter 1 basically preparing ourselves as we study it, but also as it happened, preparing the disciples for what's going to happen in chapter 2. And that's important. So in chapter 2 and verse 1 of Acts, it starts off and says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And a very simple statement, uh, but very profound. There's a lot of things in just this one verse, a lot of things that are explicitly stated, but a lot of things that are implied that are very significant in the context of what is about to happen. And there's basically two things in connection to the first part of that phrase. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come, and then when they were together in one place, shows that the day or the, the time was significant, but also the place was significant. Both of those are significant here in verse 1. The place is significant. We'll deal with that first. Um, because it ha it's happening in Jerusalem. We already saw in chapter 1 that the Lord had told them, he ascended on, on the Mount of Olives, but he told them to go down into Jerusalem, which was about three-fifths of a mile from the Mount of Olives. Go into Jerusalem, wait. There they are in the upper room, and they're in Jerusalem, and that's very significant. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit, this establishment of the church, we could say could possibly have happened anywhere in the world, right? Uh, because it's something that came from heaven, and maybe the physical location we might think is not all that significant. But there is a lot of symbolism, a lot of significance when we look at it from a spiritual standpoint that it actually did happen in Jerusalem. That was the place where the Lord had placed his name. That was the place where the temple was. That's where God had dwelled with his people for centuries. But there's even more than that to it. Uh, in Galatians, in the book of Galatians, we find a tie between... The earthly Jerusalem and the heavenly Jerusalem. In Galatians chapter 4, and we'll start in verse 24, where it says, This is allegorically speaking, for these women are the two covenants. There he's talking about uh, Sarah and Hagar. Sarah was Abraham's actual wife, and Hagar, Sarah had given, she was her handmaid, and she gave her to Abraham because Sarah herself could not bear children. So she said, hey, you have children through Hagar, and that will be uh, the, the promised descendants. But it didn't work out that way. It was going to be through Sarah. But anyways, these two women symbolize, as the Apostle Paul says, allegorically, two covenants. One proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children. So Hagar was the servant, right? She's the one that did all the work. She's the one who had to labor and things like that. And, and she bore children not through promise, but through the strength of the flesh, through 
uh, their own uh, reasoning. Sarah is the one that came up with the idea, but also in their own strength. And she bore children, but it was in connection to uh, the strength of the flesh, right? Which is in connection then to Mount Sinai, which was the covenant, which is the law, the law of Moses, which was a law of some 613 commandments. If they could keep all of those commandments, then they could live uh, before God, which was virtually impossible for them to do. Uh, but Hagar symbolizes that. And that's in connection to Jerusalem, the present Jerusalem. For she, that is the present Jerusalem, that is the earthly Jerusalem that was there in the first century, was in slavery with their children. They were still offering up sacrifices. They were still trying to keep the law. They were still going through the purification rites and all these different things. And the Apostle Paul saw that as Hagar, Jerusalem, the work of the flesh, trying to, people trying to work their way to God through the law. But then he contrasts that with, in verse 26 with the Jerusalem which is above. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. So that's the, the Jerusalem that's in accordance to Sarah, the Jerusalem that's in connection to promise because it, the promise comes from heaven. It's not something that we conjured up ourselves and trying to make our way up to God, but it's God making a promise coming down to us to freely offer us uh, the blessings connected to Abraham in which all the nations of the earth would be blessed. I mention all this to say that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 1, what do we have when the Holy Spirit is poured out? We have the heavenly Jerusalem coming into contact with the earthly Jerusalem. And those two things kind of overlapping. And so we're going to see that the earthly Jerusalem, in a sense, and again speaking metaphorically, that the, the earthly Jerusalem is going to birth forth this heavenly Jerusalem in connection to the church as the gospel message is spread out, the promises of God now being fulfilled, and people finding salvation through that message. And so the, the place is very significant, but the time is very significant as well. It says, when the day of Pentecost had come. Now, Pentecost is a term that they came up with later, the Jewish people did, and you only find the term Pentecost in the New Testament. You can find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. You can also find it in Acts, again, in Acts chapter 20. Uh, but this was a term that had kind of come uh, over time, and Pentecost just basically means 50th. So it's using the days from the time of uh, the Passover, or the day after Passover, counting 50 days, and that was the day of Pentecost. It was a feast of the Jews. In the Old Testament, it had other titles, and these titles are significant in that they give us an idea of what these feasts were all about. In Exodus 23 and verse 16, it's called the Feast of the Harvest. Now, this harvest was the grain harvest that they had. And uh, this would be the, the, the first real harvest of the year. This was a time for them to come and bring of their grain harvest. They'd bring two loaves of bread and things like that. And they would offer them up as a wave offering to the Lord. But uh, it was the Feast of Harvest. And so that gives you an idea of kind of what the feast was all about. It was them giving of the harvest. But it's also called the Day of the First Fruits in Numbers 28 and verse 26. So it, was a, it wasn't just that they were giving of the harvest, but the first fruits of the year, the first fruits of their particular harvest, was offered to the Lord. Now why is that significant? Because isn't that exactly what's going on here at Pentecost? Uh, the timing is perfect, because Pentecost, or it's also called the Feast of Weeks, because it's seven weeks from the Passover plus one day, makes the 49 days and then the 50th day. But nonetheless, this Pentecost was a time of a harvest and a time of first fruits. And you see both of those things occurring here in Acts chapter 2. What are they doing? They're, they're basically harvesting people. This first gospel message that we have recorded, or what's commonly called the first gospel message that's given in Acts chapter 2, is going to harvest 3,000 souls, which will eventually build up to 5,000 souls, which will eventually just be so many you can't even count them. But this is going to be the, the, the harvest. And if you remember, we have this Luke-Acts connection that we've talked about in the introduction, where we see that Luke and Acts are really just volume one and volume two of the same work by, uh, by Luke, by the writer Luke. And in Luke chapter 10 and verse 2, Luke quotes the Lord in this way. He says, And he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so even way back in Luke chapter 10, in quoting the Lord, we have this idea of harvest. And that's exactly what's going to take place in Acts chapter 2. God's going to be sending his laborers out into the harvest. 
to, not to harvest wheat, but to harvest people, which, by the way, wheat symbolizes people in the parable of the tares, which is significant. But this idea of wheat, a people, a harvest, this is all in connection to what's happening here in Acts chapter 2. So very appropriate that this would be happening at Pentecost, the Feast of the Harvest. But also significant, if you're looking at it with the title of the Day of the First Fruits. What do we find in Acts chapter 2? But the first fruits of the kingdom of heaven now coming down in power through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the first fruits can be looked at in two different ways. The first fruits of the actual people who are now being gathered in. That first 3,000 people who uh, repented and were baptized and were counted among God's people. You can see that as the first fruits. The first fruits is always the first of something. If you, were, you had a great harvest, the first grain that you harvested, that was the first fruits. It was always seen as, as the, the better of the rest of the harvest. But, but they also had the first fruits of wine and other things as well. But anyways, here you have the first fruits of people who are coming to be a part of this kingdom being done in Acts chapter 2. But you also have the first fruits in the sense that the Holy Spirit is being poured out. The first fruits of the Spirit. This is talked about in Romans chapter 8 in connection to all of creation. The Apostle Paul is recognizing the fact that, you know what, and we've seen this, right? We've seen the wildfires in the past couple of weeks, but we've witnessed hurricanes even in our own area. Uh, we've seen all types of things happening in creation that uh, just really shows that creation has this sense in which it's in angst, uh, like in childbirth. And that's what uh, the Apostle Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 8. Where he says in verse 22, For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. But then he goes on to say in verse 23, And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. In other words, the resurrection. So the Apostle Paul says we have the first fruits of the Spirit. So the Spirit is seen as the first fruits which is significant. Then if you cross-reference Ephesians chapter 1, where the Holy Spirit is spoken as one who is really given with the promise of more to come, basically. Um, we find this in Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll begin to read, I guess, in verse 13. It says, In Him, that is in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, by the way, that's what's going to happen in Acts chapter 2. They're going to hear the, the message of truth, the gospel of salvation. Having also believed, we're going to see people believing, and that's been happening over 2,000 years since. You are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse 14, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. And if you cross-reference Revelation chapter 2, 21, you find that the inheritance is new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, those who overcome will inherit these things. Uh, also in connection to the resurrection, as it continues on, he says, A pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit itself is seen as a first fruit. It's a foretaste of new creation. It's a foretaste of new life. It's a foretaste of God's ultimate plan for all of creation. And so that outpouring of this Holy Spirit of first fruits, we might could say, is happening here in Acts chapter 2 at the feast or the day of the first fruits, as the feast was commonly called uh, and even scripturally called in Numbers 28. So it's significant in that it happened at Pentecost because of this tie to the, the feast that's there. But it's also significant, the timing of it. If we go with is traditionally believed by the Jews, and this traces all the way back to uh, the intertestamental period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament and the book of Jubilees. In chapter 1 and verse 1, uh, you have uh, Pentecost being tied to the covenant being given in, at Mount Sinai. And they would say that it happened on the same day. The same day that the covenant was given at Mount Sinai, there in the wilderness, way back in the book of Exodus, that same day, that day of the year it is, is the same day that Pentecost would take place, whenever they celebrated the first fruits, which would make sense because that was the first fruits of when the nation of Israel was being established as a nation, so on and so forth. Uh, but if we take that tradition to be true, and I don't really see any reason why not to, we can see that this is significant because what happened at Mount Sinai? The Old Covenant was given. 
And what happened after that? They worshiped the golden calf and 3,000 people died in the wilderness. Here in Acts chapter 2, what's happening? The new covenant is being established. Jeremiah 31. Behold, I will establish with you a new covenant. And what happened in connection to that? 3,000 were saved. And so you can see a connection, even whether you take them to happening at the same time, you can see a connection between what happened at Mount Sinai and even what's happening here in Acts chapter 2. And so the day is very uh, significant, and there's great reason why Luke would specify exactly what day this actually took place. But it's also significant what they're doing. It's not just significant where they are, nor just significant of what time it is or what day it is, but it's also significant what they were doing. It says they were all together in one place. Now there's a lot, you know, explicitly stated there, but also a lot implied as well, especially if we take in chapter 1. They were all together, which shows what? Unity. They were there together, unified in one place. Later on, it's called a house, but I believe it's that same upper room that was uh, talked about uh, in chapter 1, in in verse 13, where it says, when they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. So it's not too much of a stretch of the imagination to see that probably in chapter 2, they're still in that upper room, hanging out where they were staying. But also in verse 14 of chapter 1, we saw the unity of heart that they had. It says, these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. And it goes on and lists some people. And so they're, they were all together in one place, unified. Not just because they were in one spot, but mentally they were all in one spot. Um, in, in faith, they were all in one spot, we could say. And so they're all in that one location. They're unified. But also implied here is that they're in a state of obedience and submission to the Lord. They were all together in one place. Why? Because they just liked each other and they had a lot in common? That might have played some part in there, but mainly we would say because Jesus told them to stay there. Uh, Remember in chapter 1, he told them in verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what uh, what the Father had promised. So while they're gathered together in one place, they're in unity, but they're also in submission and obedience to Christ. And then we could also say, as they're there in that room, that they're also in a state of anticipation. If they didn't really believe that Jesus was going to fulfill what he promised, would they even be there? There's a lot more other places they could have been at, a lot more locations they could have gone. But they were there because they, they believed what Jesus said, that if we stay here, if we stay put, then, then the promise of the Father is going to come upon us and the power of the Holy Spirit is going to come. And so they're in a state of anticipation as well. So what are they doing as they're waiting in that upper room, staying there? They're unified. They're being obedient to Christ, and they're anticipating the promises to come. Can you think of a better explanation or a better description of what we are doing now as the church? The church is called to be unified. Philippians chapter 2 spells this out very specifically, where he says in verse 3, I'm sorry, actually, uh, verse 2. Philippians 2 and verse 2, it says, Make my joy complete. By being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent, in one purpose. So as a church, we are to be experiencing unity. That's just something that goes along with what we're doing. But also, as a church, we're we're anticipating what the Lord has promised. That is, that the Lord is coming again by being obedient and submissive to the will of Christ. What does Jesus tell the apostles to tell everyone right after they're baptized or as they're baptizing them and making disciples? To obey it, all that he had commanded, right? And that's what we are as a church. When we are baptized, whenever we are unified together as a church, we are stepping into a life of obedience and submission to him, but also a life of anticipation. He's promised that he's coming again. He's promised that he's coming to judge the world. He's coming to make all things right. He's he's coming to establish justice. And we wait in anticipation of that. But all the while being unified, all the while being submissive to Christ, and all the while anticipating his coming, that's a good picture of the church right there. But we could even personalize that as well. 
And we talked about last week how we can personally be living in a state of expectation and preparation for the power of God to work in our lives. And these things ought to be at play in that as well, for just looking at our personal lives. We should be living in unity with others, in love and respect for other people. Uh, as Philippians 2 would go on to say, you know, treating other people as more important than yourself, living in unity with other people, but at the same time living a life of obedience, submission, and devotion to Christ. All the while, we're seeking the power of God to work in our lives. And then doing it, praying to the Lord and seeking His power and His help in the spiritual life and in the work of the kingdom with a sense of anticipation. Not saying, well, I'll pray to the Lord to give me the power to accomplish His will, but then, you know, I don't think it's really going to happen, but I'll go ahead and pray it because I'm supposed to. No, saying, you know what, if I get down on my knees, I pray to the Lord, Lord, let your power be, be evident in my life, both to overcome sin and temptation, but also to go out and do the work of the kingdom. We get down on our knees and say, Lord, I need power from on high to help me in the spiritual life and in the work of the kingdom. Do it with anticipation. You think God's up in heaven and saying, no, no, uh, this is my power. I'm not going to give it to you. We read last week, Ephesians chapter 1, also Ephesians chapter 3. Paul said, I want you to know the power that God has, the, the power that is in you that's in connection to the resurrection of Christ. And I want you to be aware of that, that there is a power available to us. And we'll describe that more in a moment, but anticipating that the Lord can work through us and he can work through us in a very powerful and mighty way especially when we're weak, especially in the areas where we are uh, struggling, perhaps, as we try to be obedient to Him. And so, collectively, individually, I think this has application for us. But then in verse 2, we see the actual outpouring of the Holy Spirit taking place. It says, And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And suddenly, often, oftentimes this is the way the Lord works, suddenly. Maybe you've experienced this in your life. Maybe you've prayed something for years. Maybe you were struggling with something. Maybe it was uh, another loved one that you were praying for. And maybe you began to think, you know, maybe there's no hope. These people have been laboring in prayer for 10 days. You know, it's like, okay, this is day 10. Lord, you know, you know we we're keep praying. We're devoting ourselves. Don't be surprised if you are surprised at the fact that the Lord suddenly can come in and answer our prayers unexpectedly sometimes. It really catches off guard and how quickly he moves in, in our direction. It might be on Monday. We're weak, we're heavy laden, we're bringing our cares and anxieties to the Lord. We're coming to the Lord saying, Lord, I need strength from on high. I need a power beyond myself to get through these struggles, through these hardships, through these temptations, to accomplish your will. And on Monday, we're seeking the Lord. Don't be surprised if on Tuesday, the Lord answers that prayer. And before you know it, you're up and going and accomplishing God's will in your life personally and in the community at whole. But... It came suddenly. It says, there came from heaven. And that word for heaven can be translated either heaven or sky, which uh, I think the New American Standard is pretty good at translating it as heaven because heaven can kind of mean both. In ancient times, heaven was the sky. They would, um, of course, you had heaven proper, which is, you know, God's dwelling place. But then you also had the heavens, which was uh, what we call outer space now. And then they had the heavens, which was the sky. But this term could be translated here as heaven proper as we think about it or as the sky. And I would say it probably came from both. That heaven now, Christ has ascended into heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. And where would we expect the noise to come from but from heaven? And we've been talking about this uh, uh, new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, which is from above. Certainly the sound would come from that heavenly Jerusalem and contact the earthly Jerusalem and make an impact. And he says it. Uh, it came from heaven. Oh, and then it could also literally come from the sky. Okay, it could have been just manifested there as coming from the sky. But it says it was a noise like a violent rushing wind, uh, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So where you think this whole wind filled the house or the sound filled the whole house, um, either way, this manifestation of the power of God was violent, or I believe the King James says a mighty rushing wind. In other words, it was powerful, but it is also 
filling. It filled everything. Uh, which is a picture of the work of the Holy Spirit. And especially would be a picture of the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives. You think about a rushing mighty wind. That's a very powerful thing. I'm sure a lot of you remember Hurricane Harvey. And I know a lot of people were uh, active in helping the cleanup of Hurricane Harvey, even from our church. And we saw the destruction that wind can have. Violent wind can tear down houses. It can tear down power lines, trees. It can just cause ultimate destruction. I'm sure Sam knows about that from tornadoes and things like that. Violent wind describes a mighty power that comes. And that's what's being described here, but not just a mighty power, an invisible power, which is kind of what the, how the Holy Spirit works. Uh, if you remember in John chapter 3, Jesus said, you must be born of water and the Spirit. And he said, those that are born of the Spirit, it's, it's kind of like the wind. You know, you, you can't see it, but you can definitely see it manifested. And the same thing is true with the working of the Holy Spirit. You, when we talk about walking in the power of the Spirit and the power of God, both in living a sanctified life, but also in doing the work of the kingdom, we're not talking about levitating and lightning coming out of our eyes and, you know, we, we begin to glow in the dark or something like that. When we're talking about walking in the power of the Spirit, we're just talking about the Holy Spirit giving us the strength to do the work. And it's an invisible power that's not necessarily visual, but it's definitely detectable as we see the fruits of that being manifested in our lives, in the lives of others. But this was, a, this was a noise like a violent rushing wind. Oh, and it filled the whole house. What was the purpose of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit? That the whole world would be filled with the gospel message. That the whole world would be filled with the kingdom and the dominion of God on the earth. As the Holy Spirit would, would be given to those who would receive the gospel message. Starting in Jerusalem, going to Judea, Samaria, and to the remotest parts of the earth. And so all these descriptions of what was going on and keep in mind these are just descriptions Luke's, Luke isn't saying it was a violent mush, rushing wind it, that it was tongues of fire he just says it's as these things if something so mysterious he just had to use descriptions to describe it but nonetheless these descriptions are very descriptive of not just what happened there but descriptive of what how the Holy Spirit would work uh, through the working of the apostles and the early Christians as they, as they spread the gospel and us as well and in verse 3 it says, And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves as they rested on each one of them. All right, there appeared to them tongues as of fire. Uh, it's interesting if you, look, if you compare verse 2 and verse 3 together, there's, some, there's some, uh, think, some parallels here. You have noise connected to tongues, and you have wind connected to fire. So you can say noisy tongues and and uh, wind and fire, or something like that. These two things seem to be tied together, these two ideas. But the idea here of the tongues as of fire distributing themselves, I think that King James says cloven tongues or divided tongues. The original word in the original language is kind of difficult to translate into English. Um, it has the idea of tongues being divided, but, and also uh, the idea of fire, tongues of fire being divided. But it's not clear if each tongue that came upon them was divided or if they came as tongues that were divided over them, that was portioned out to each one of them and coming upon them. The New American Standard kind of takes more of a vague way of being able to encapsulate both ideas just by saying that uh, the tongues as fire distributing themselves and they rested on each of them. Uh, just the idea that the, these tongues of fire came on all of them. And of course, it's significant that it came as tongues. You might say, why tongues? You know? Uh, why couldn't it be like a hand coming down on them or, or like a head or a foot or something like that? But tongues, again, this is all in connection to what they were about to do. In the immediate context, it's connected to the fact that they were going to speak in tongues and they were going to be able to speak in a language that everybody could understand. And that's probably the most close connection to these tongues being distributed on them. But we could also say, isn't that how the kingdom is spread on the earth? Isn't it through the tongue? Romans chapter 8. How can they believe unless they hear? And how can they hear unless someone's sent to them to proclaim the gospel? How beautiful are the feet of those who uh, preach the good news? Um, the kingdom comes not with sword and spear and javelin and machine guns and helicopters. It comes through the tongue, through the sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so it would be no stretch of the imagination to say 
That's why the Holy Spirit would appear as tongues, because it would be the tongues that the Holy Spirit would use to spread the gospel and to bring about the spread of the kingdom of heaven. But it's also tongues as a fire, which is significant. These apostles weren't just going to be going around telling people nice little, giving them nice little quotes and, uh, you know, little pleasant uh, poems or something like that. They were going to be speaking tongues of fire. Judgment's coming. The Lord's coming to judge the earth again, especially as they spoke to their fellow countrymen, the Jews, saying, look, this is the Messiah that you were looking for. As we continue on in chapter 2, we won't get to it today, but when we read the message given by Peter, there's some fire in that message, you know. There is some beautiful things about the promise and, and, and quoting from Joel and how wonderful it is that they're being you know, experiencing it. But there's fire there, and that fire catches fire on the people as they say, man, what shall we do? They were scared when they heard the message of the gospel. And so fire in Scripture is symbolic of judgment. And as they spoke their tongues of the gospel, there is a mixture of judgment, which I think is missing kind of, at least in my generation, a little bit. Uh, I mean, I think it's still around, don't get me wrong, but typically we want to just give, oh, Jesus loves you. Uh, we, we may picture God as this grandfather in the sky. You know, you can't do anything wrong. There is, of course, God is a loving God, and there's some elements of that. But there's also judgment. The Lord says, look, if you don't turn to me, there's judgment waiting for you. In Revelation chapter 20, we said, anyone whose name's not book, written in the book of life is thrown into the lake of fire. <laughs> I mean, that's not a pleasant picture, but it's a necessary one. We don't like to say it because we don't want to sound judgmental, but I think if, if, if you think of the world as an airplane that's about to crash, we want to let people know about the parachutes that are available so that they can jump out safely. And that's all it is when we say that judgment is coming, the Lord's coming in judgment. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 talks about the elements will burn with fervent heat. All the, the earth and all its works will be destroyed. We're not saying that because, oh, look, we're the only people with parachutes and all, all the rest of you are going to die. We're saying we have the parachute and we have plenty to hand out. Please come and take your parachute. Be saved with us. Uh, it's not us judging you or saying you're going to be destroyed. It's saying there is a way of salvation and we want you to enter into it. And so speaking with tongues of fire isn't, Meaning that you're condescending or judgmental. It just means that you very much love the other person and you're telling them the reality of things and you want them to be saved from that. Um, and that's what they would be participating in as they go into the world. In verse 4, And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Filled with the Holy Spirit. Chapter 1, the promise was they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And, boy... There's been a lot of discussion on the difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And those who would say baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit is the same thing uh, could very well use this text to say, look, Jesus said they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it's just described as them being filled with the Holy Spirit here in the verse. And there's an argument for that. But as we reference other places in the New Testament, there seems to be these two things uh, are, are distinguished from one another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit kind of being spoken of as an event in the past, a definite event that happens in the believer uh, upon them coming to Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all, to made, we were all made to drink of one Spirit. And so the idea of baptism, being baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body, uh, seems to be indicated or tied to one initially coming to Christ. But if you cross-reference Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, you see a call for, a continual call for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, it says, And do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so an argument could also be made that these are two distinct things. Initially, and we'll, we'll get more into the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, we're probably going to maybe get more into it than you want. But <laughs> when we get to verse 38 of Acts chapter 2, I'm planning on having a whole lesson just on the Holy Spirit because that's where he says this promise is to you. And so uh, we'll get into it in more detail. But 
we see enough now to where we can see, well, maybe, maybe there is a difference between just the baptism of the Holy Spirit being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because we'll find even with the apostles, here they're filled with the Holy Spirit. But then later on, Peter's going to, when he's standing before the Sanhedrin, it'll say, and, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak. As though the filling of the Holy Spirit seems to be something that occurs uh, multiple times, whereas the baptism of the Holy Spirit seems to happen only once. I know that's a very controversial topic, not just, you know, within our circles, but in all of Christendom, uh, there's a lot of argument that goes on. But the main thing here is that, the, that they have the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay, that's, that's mainly what Luke is trying to portray to us. They had the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. He filled them just as he filled the room. And they were going out, and he was doing it in a very powerful way, speaking in a very powerful way. It said, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. In verse 5, now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. So this sound wasn't just something that the apostles thought that they heard. This is something that all of Jerusalem heard. They heard that mighty sound. They're like, whoa, what's going on? It got their attention. And then they began to hear these guys speaking in their own language, their own native tongue. Uh... In verse 7 it says, they were amazed and astonished, saying, why are, not all these who, uh, why are not all these who are speaking Galilean, Galilean, Galileans? And by the way, Galileans, they had kind of an accent. They were kind of like country folks. And now here you have these country folks speaking in all these different languages. It definitely got everybody's attention. Uh, it says, and how is it, verse 8, that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. Uh, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and saying they are full of sweet wine. These guys are drunk. Which again, if we think about Ephesians chapter 5, what did Paul say? Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's what's going on. They're not drunk with wine, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And they're proclaiming the message in a language that everyone can understand. And as we talk about, talked about in the introduction, it seems to be an undoing of the curse of Babel. What happened in Babel? <coughs> Humanity was not fulfilling their role. God had told them to fill the earth, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion over it. And at Babel... They were all congregating in one particular area on the earth. They were all speaking the same language so they could kind of hang out together and understand one another. And they even built this big tower uh, that was to reach up into heaven so that they could make a name for themselves. And God confused their language so that they would have to scatter, so that they would go into their own different camps, so that they could be with other people with the same language, and they would then fulfill God's commission for them to spread out. Here you have people understanding the language barrier being over, over, overcome through this Holy Spirit speaking and people being gathered in, in unity, to become the church, as we'll, we'll see when 3,000 are saved. But it's not a perfect correction of the Tower of Bible. It, it doesn't say that languages went away. It doesn't say that, oh, now the Cretans and Arabs and stuff, they now spoke one language. It says through the Spirit they could all hear the same language. So, yes, there's an undoing of the Tower of Babel, but the emphasis is that it's only through the Holy Spirit that this unity, this overcoming this barrier would take place. And so you, it's, again, tying this idea of the Spirit with unity. As we read in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 earlier, um, there's unity that comes out of the Holy Spirit's working uh, in the church. But from, from an application standpoint... What do we see here? Do we walk away saying, okay, now I'm going to walk out that door and through the Holy Spirit I'm going to start speaking Spanish, which, by the way, I, I took two years of Spanish and I can't speak it much better than I did before I started. No, but what we could say is we need the Lord to help us to speak to other people in a way that they can understand. Not necessarily speaking in different languages, but speaking to them in a way that they can understand. Didn't Jesus do that? He spoke to Nicodemus in a different way than he spoke to the woman at the well. What did he speak to the woman at the well? Something she knew. Water. 
If you speak to me, I'll give you living water that you'll never thirst again. Having that ability to speak to people in a way that they'll understand uh, and to live in a way that will make the gospel more fruitful in a particular person's life or in, even in a particular location. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 20, the Apostle Paul said, To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. The Apostle Paul said, I adapt myself based on who I'm speaking to, who I'm ministering to, so that they get the best benefit, so that they can receive the gospel. He doesn't say that he changes the gospel. The gospel remains the same. It's just the approach that he takes in presenting the gospel might vary depending on who he's ministering to. And it takes wisdom. It takes help from the Lord to know how to speak into a person's life in a way that they'll understand. And I'll be the first to attest, when you go to seminary school, you learn a lot of really cool terms. And you want to, you know, when you're speaking, a lot of times that just becomes a part of your language because you're writing research papers and stuff. It's always important to understand that, you know, we need to be able to speak. Even those who grew up in the church, you know the biblical language and stuff. When we're speaking to people at the workplace or people who don't come from a religious context, always speak in a way um, that meets them where they are. And, and that they can understand and apprehend. Um, we just start throwing a whole bunch of Bible verses at them and stuff. You know, are we really going to be effective? Um, using things that commonplace between us and them to communicate is very helpful. And that, that's not easy. It's not always easy. Sometimes, or we always need, really, the help of the Holy Spirit. We need the help of God in order to, to communicate the things of the gospel effectively. Um, it worked here in this particular context in a way that was needed. I believe that God will do it in our particular context in a way that's needed as well. And so that, I think that's a good place for us to stop. Uh, Lord willing, next week we'll get into Peter's sermon. There's a lot to unpackage there. Very significant sermon. Uh, really helps set up not only the rest of the book of Acts, but the whole New Testament. A lot of things in that uh, sermon that point to other things that we learn later on in the New Testament. If you're here this morning and you want to give your life to the Lord, you want to commit your life to him, you want to put on your parachute and be saved from the judgment to come, uh, if you want to come and begin to live in the strength and the power of the Lord, and not just in your own strength or your own ability to get through life, but really lean on the Lord and in his strength, uh, we invite you to